Good morning again from the Fort Bragg Seventh-day Adventist Church. Here we are worshiping our Savior on this beautiful Sabbath day in Fort Bragg, California. We welcome all that have tuned in. We welcome Bruce, Sam, some loving folks in Texas, El Paso that we know are watching, and even Limo out in Africa. He's probably tuning in today. So we love Limo. He contacted us many years ago and he's still hanging in there, amazing. Someday we've got to meet Limo. We just have to know who he is and maybe we can have that happen on this earth if we know it'll happen in heaven, but maybe it can even happen on this earth. So welcome everybody. This morning we're gonna talk about Jesus. What a subject to be talking about on Sabbath here. Jesus, our savior. The title is, Has Jesus Touched You? and me has Jesus touched us so let us uh, let us ask God to be with us again as we always must do eternal father we're thankful this morning to be in your presence again we invite you to be with us as we study your word you've left us the scriptures as a pathway to the kingdom of God it gives us a pathway to know what will happen we know the end of the story. The end of the story is Satan is defeated. Jesus wins. He's already won. May we understand that in its depth and its fullness. Bless us today as we study with you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We start this morning with words that were written many years ago by Lincoln. You've probably heard this before. More than 2,000 years ago, there was a man born contrary to the laws of life. This man lived in poverty and was reared in obscurity. He did not travel extensively. He walked Galilee many days. He possessed neither wealth nor influence. His relatives, well, they were just inconspicuous, uninfluential, and had neither training nor education. Imagine. In infancy, he startled a king. In childhood, he puzzled the doctors. In manhood, he ruled the course of nature. He walked upon the billows as if they were pavement and hushed the sea to sleep with his word. He healed the multitude without medicine. He made no charge for his services. He never wrote a book, and yet all the libraries of this country could not hold the books that had been written about him. He never wrote a song, and yet he was furnished has furnished the theme for more songs than all songwriters combined. He never practiced medicine, and yet he has healed more broken hearts than all the doctors far and near. He's never marshaled an army, nor drafted a soldier, nor fired a gun, and yet no leader ever had more volunteers. He is the star of astronomy, the rock of geology, the lion and the lamb of the zoological kingdom, he is a revealer of the snares that lurk in the darkness, the rebuker of everything evil that prowls at night, the quickener of all that is wholesome, the adorner of all that is beautiful, the reconciler of all that is contradictory, the harmonizer of all discords. Isn't that beautiful? The healer of all diseases and the savior of all mankind. He fills the pages of theology and hymnology. Every prayer that goes up to God goes up in his name and is asked to be granted for Jesus' sake. The names of the past proud statesmen of Greece and Rome have come and gone. The names of the past scientists and philosophers and theologians have come and gone. But the name of this man abounds more and more, though time has spread 2,000 years between the people of this generation and the scenes of his crucifixion. And yet, he still lives. Herod could not kill him, Satan could not seduce him. Death could not destroy him. And the grave, the grave could not hold him. He stands forth upon the highest pinnacle of heavenly glory, proclaimed of God, acknowledged by angels, adored by saints, and feared by the devils as the living, personal Christ. This man, as you know, was Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Let's start with Matthew 9, 
35 and 36. The subject primarily focuses this morning on Jesus touching people. Matthew 9, and Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing their sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as a sheep, having no shepherd. Here we have the first clue as to how Jesus operated and how he dealt with people at the time he was here on earth. He had great compassion on them. Here he had come from the throne room of the universe, guiding the planets and the billions of galaxies of stars, came down to earth and walked among us as a common person and touched people, touched people, and healed their minds and their diseases. Let's go to Mark 1. We're going to have a lot of Bible this morning. Mark 1, starting with verse 34 and onward, And he healed many that were sick of diverse diseases, and cast out many devils, and suffered not the devils to speak, because they knew him. So Satan's angels knew the Savior. Caiaphas, Annas, the high priest, did not seem to know Jesus, but the angels of Satan knew him. Isn't that interesting? And the morning rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. And Simon and they that were with him followed after him. And they had found him, they said unto him, All men seek for thee. And he said unto them, Let us go into the next towns that I may preach there also. For therefore came I forth. And he preached in their synagogues throughout Galilee and cast out devils. And there came a leper to him, beseeching him and kneeling down to him, saying unto him, If thou wilt, you can make me clean. And Jesus moved with compassion, put forth his hand, and what did he do? He touched him and said unto him, I will be thou clean. In that day and age, if you touched a leper, you were considered unclean yourself. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy departed from him, and he was cleansed. We next turn to Matthew 9:18 onward. While he spake these things unto them, behold, there came a certain ruler and worshipped him, saying, My daughter is even now dead, but come and just lay your hand upon her, and she will live. And Jesus arose and followed him, so did his disciples. And when Jesus came into the ruler's house and saw the minstrels and the people making noise, he said unto them, Give place. In other words, get them out of here. Said it kindly, but men, get them out of here. For the maid is not dead, but she sleeps. And they laughed him to scorn. Can you picture that scene? But when the people were put forth, he went in and took her by the hand and touched her. And the maid arose, and the fame thereof spread abroad in all the land. Jesus had healed that girl. Here we have Jesus taking the hand of a small girl who had died and touched her. Again, we say that he was transferring her death unto himself to take it to Calvary. Our next story is Matthew 9, 20. And behold, a woman who was diseased with an issue of blood 12 years came behind him and touched the hem of his garment. For she said within herself, if I, but, if I can just touch his garment, I will be healed. But Jesus turned about and said, Daughter, be of good comfort. Your faith has made you whole. And the woman was made whole from that very hour. We now turn to Matthew 9, 27 onward. And Jesus departed hence. Two blind men followed him, crying and saying, Thou son of David, have mercy on us. When he was come into the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said unto them, Believe ye that I am able to do this? Do you think I can do this, really? They said unto him, Oh, yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it unto you. And their eyes were opened. Their eyes were opened. We next turn to Mark 3.10 and onward, for he healed many insomuch that they pressed upon him for as to just touch him. As many as had plagues, the unclean spirits, when he saw him, fell down before him and cried, saying, the unclean spirits, that's Satan's angels, folks. The Bible says, when they saw him, they fell down before him and cried, saying, thou art the son of God. Satan's angels. Here we have an amazing statement. Many of the Pharisees and such people as Caiaphas and Annas and Herod, they did not know who they were dealing with. 
They did not see him as the son of God, but here unclean spirits who formerly were in heaven above were part of the throng of angels who surrounded God's throne until they sinned with Lucifer and were cast out of heaven. Down here on earth recognized the son of God, an amazing paradox. We turn next to Mark's, Mark 8, 22 through 25. And he comes to Bethesda and they bring a blind man unto him and besought him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes, put his hands upon him, he asked him if he saw. And he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. After that, he put his hands again upon his eyes and made him look up and it was restored. And the man saw very clearly, very clearly. Now I've been interested in this sequence here as recorded in scripture where Jesus had twice healed blind people, but the scripture records that he spit, then he placed that on their eyes. I was intrigued enough to find out what this really meant, so I looked up in a reference concordance and found that in that day the people thought there was some special healing power in saliva. That's what they believed. So we find that Jesus was simply putting himself in the eyes of these people as though he were one of them and on their level. Isn't that interesting? There was nothing about the saliva that healed the blind man, but it was that Jesus was trying to show them that he was one of them, knowing that he was, that that was their belief. Next we turn to Luke 18, 15 and onward. And they brought unto him also infants that he would, what? Touch them. But when his disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus said, suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child shall in no wise enter therein. Isn't that interesting? The faith and naivety of a child, Jesus says, that's important in my kingdom. Here we have a remarkable statement from Jesus' own lips. As we see little children play, we see their naivety, we see their innocence, we see their questioning minds. Jesus is telling us here that if you do not act like and be like a child in terms of your acceptance of him, in terms of your approach to life and other people, you will not enter the kingdom of God. This is an amazing statement again from Jesus' own lips. We next turn to Matthew 14, 35. And when the man of that place had knowledge of him, they went out into all that country round about and brought unto him all that were diseased and besought him that they might only touch the hem of his garment. And as many as touched him were made perfectly whole. We turn next to Mark 7, 32 and onward. And they br bring unto him one of, that was deaf and had impediment in his speech. So he was deaf and he couldn't talk very well. They beseeched him to put his hand upon him and he took him aside from the multitude and put his fingers into his ears and he spit and touched his tongue and looked up into heaven. He sighed and saith unto him, Ephthaniah, that is, be opened, translating from the Hebrew. And straightway his ears were opened and the string of his tongue was loosed and he spoke plainly. The string of his tongue. <laughs> Was open, was, and he spoke plainly. Another version of the Bible, the New Living Translation tells us, Jesus took the saliva on his own fingers and touched the man. So here we have the same events of healing that we started with earlier with the blind men. We come now to Matthew 14, 26 and onward. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, it is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spoke unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. If you read through the New Testament, you will find so many times the words, Don't be fearful. Be not afraid. Over and over again you read those words in the New Testament. Then Peter answered him and said, Lord, if, he, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to see Jesus. Can you picture that scene? But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and began to sink. He cried out saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus, what did he do? He stretched out his hand and touched him and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, why did you doubt? 
He doubted because he took his eyes off of Jesus. And when they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. They that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth, you are the Son of God. Here we have another example of Jesus touching his own disciples when he thought he was about to die. We turn next to Matthew 17, verse 1. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, bringeth them up into the high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as a light. Behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias, talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you will, let us make here three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and be not afraid. When they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus alone. Here we have this amazing event where Jesus was transfigured with the disciples sleeping a short distance away. Then we have Jesus coming down to the disciples, finding them asleep. He touched them and said, Arise and be not afraid. In terms of be not afraid are those familiar words we hear all through the New Testament from Jesus. The people and even some angels who came to this earth when Jesus was here on earth. We come now to another text in Matthew 8, 14. Then Jesus came into Peter's house. He saw his wife's mother laid with sick of a fever. And he touched her hand and fever left her. She arose and ministered unto them. When the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out the spirits with his word. Just his word cast out the spirits and healed all that were sick that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses from Isaiah. That comment made me think of Isaiah 53 where it says, Jesus will bear our iniquities. So I turn to Isaiah 53. You've read it many times. Let's review some of those verses here this morning, starting with verse 3. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him, and he was despised, and we esteemed him not. This verse certainly refers to the cross of Calvary. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, and yet he, we did esteem him stricken and smitten of God and afflicted. So here we have this word born, B-O-R-N-E, born. He hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. But he was wounded for our transgressions, and he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace is upon him, but with his stripes we are healed. So here we have our iniquities were put upon him at the cross. All weak like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one into his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquities of us all. Here we have the same theme that our sins are laid upon Jesus. We go to verse 11. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. What a beautiful sentiment that is. Here we have the same theme coming through when Jesus went to the cross. He bore our iniquities and sin was transferred it to himself. Then another verse in chapter 53 that every time I read it, it just makes, it stuns me. We have these words from verse 10, Isaiah 53, verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord, meaning God the Father, to bruise him. You mean to tell me God the Father was pleased when Jesus was on the cross? That's what the Bible says. This is saying that the Eternal Father was pleased to have Jesus bruised on the cross so that we might be saved. Isn't that something? I looked up this text in another translation, a New Living Translation, and here are those words from verse 10. It was the Lord's good plan to crush him, crush him and cause him grief. Yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. 
He will enjoy a long life and the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. When he sees that all that is accomplished by his anguish, he, Jesus, will be satisfied. Isn't that a beautiful rendition, New Living Translation? We have the same theme from the eternal God and Father being satisfied with the event on Calvary. Then the amazing words of this version, it says, it was the Lord's good plan to crush him or to crush Jesus on the cross so that we might be saved. We turn now to 2 Corinthians 5, 19 and 21. To wit that God was in Christ on the cross, reconciling the world unto him, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. For hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that he might be made the righteousness of God and man. So Jesus, who was 100% righteous, took all of our sins onto himself, became the sin bearer so that we can go free. What a trade that is. Jesus transferring all sin and disease to him while he was here on earth. This brings us to this amazing truth, thinking of Calvary's hill with the three crosses, with Jesus in the middle, the two thieves on either side. We know the story well from scripture. We have this truth. The thief on one side was cursing Jesus until he died. That man unfortunately had sin in him and on him. Think carefully now. The thief that was cursing Jesus to the end of his life had sin in him and on him. The thief on the other side, however, who was promised salvation and promised a home in heaven, he still had sin in him because he will save that until glorification when he's raised from the grave. So he had sin in him, but no sin on him. Jesus had taken it. For Jesus had taken it all away and placed it on himself. Hmm. Then the man in the middle, Jesus on the cross, he had sin in him, but no sin on him. Everyone's sin from the beginning of time. Let's repeat that. The thief who was going down to destruction that day had eternal loss, had sin in him and on him. The other thief who was promised eternal life had sin in him, but no sin on him. Jesus had no sin in him, but sin was all over him, yours and mine. I come to the last story now, as recorded in Luke 7, 11 and onward. And it came to pass that day, after he went into the city called Nain, went with much people. Now then he came nigh to the gate of the city. Behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. By the way, let me pause, hit the pause button here for a moment. Um, the name widow brings to my mind something that I found. This year I'm reading the Bible through. I'm already into Ezekiel. It's been pretty fast. I'm way ahead of what they outlined for the, the whole year. But I've been amazed. I was searching for other things when I started this project of reading the Bible through. I was searching for other ideas. But what's hit me over and over and over again, from Chronicles all the way through to Ezekiel, how many times the Bible mentions widows and orphans, over and over and over and over again it mentions, we need to take care of the widows and the orphans. And Jesus says, that's me there you're looking at, that's me. Amazing. She was a widow. And much people of the city was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said unto her, Weep not. And he came and he touched the beer. He touched the wooden beer. And they that bare him stood still. And he said, Young man, I say unto thee, Arise. And he that was dead sat up and began to speak. And he delivered him unto his mother. Can you picture that scene? Oh my. And there came a fear on all that they glorified God, saying, A great prophet is risen among us, and that God hath visited his people. I turn away from the scriptures for a few moments to relate a story that comes to us from North Korea. Some of you may have heard this story, but it's worth repeating just now. North Korea, the land of atheists. True story from that dark country of North Korea, that atheist land, 
One day a Chinese pastor who lived on the border of North Korea and China noted that a visitor had come in and sat down in the church in the back row. When he had finished his sermon, he went back to see who this was and to talk with her. He was familiar with visitors who came asking for money or aid of some kind, so he engaged her in conversation thinking that she wanted money. It was immediately apparent she was different. Through the difficult language barrier, she said, I am a Christian and I want to be baptized. What? He was amazed at what he was hearing. Yes, he said, I have a Bible, I have studied, and I am a Christian. I want to be baptized. Though her tears, she kept saying, I must be baptized, I must be baptized. She had escaped from the atheistic, intolerant North Korea, risking her life to cross into China. The pastor quickly assured her that he would study with her. And study he did. After months of time, it was obvious to him that she knew her Lord and was a Christian and was born again, and she loved Jesus. The only place in the church for a baptism would be in the bathroom downstairs where they just happened to have a bathtub. So the day came in the darkened room. He baptized her in the newness of life in that old tub. She was jubilant. And she started saying, I must find my way into freedom to South Korea now. After much preparation, the pastor advised her not to go she started out traveling at night through North Korea toward the border. She made it all the way to the border of North Korea and South Korea. That evening she arrived there. She sent the pastor a message on her phone. I've made it to the border, she said. Tonight is the night I'm going into South Korea. When she arrived there, she was soon aware that there were eight barbed wire barriers between herself and South Korea. She started out at night, but about halfway through she was noticed and was captured. A short time later, the pastor received word that she had been executed somewhere in that vast atheistic country. How she obtained a Bible is unknown. Her grave is likely unmarked. On the resurrection morning, when the trumpet sounds, she will come out of her dusty bed and likely meet her guardian angel first and then look up and see Jesus coming in the clouds of heaven. That moment reminds me of the words of a song. When all my labors and trials are o'er, and I'm safe on that beautiful shore, just to be near the dear Lord I adore will through the ages be glory for me. When by his grace I shall look on his face, that will be glory, glory for me. The question comes to us, has Jesus touched us he touched you and me as he touched this little Korean lady. I decided, decided to look through my Bible in the New Testament and find verses that I think this North Korean lady probably had read and she was, as she was giving her life to Jesus. We start with John 10, 7, 27 and onward. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Interesting text, isn't it? My sheep hear my voice I know them, and they follow me. In other words, they know me too. I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. And I and the Father are one. This word pluck really intrigues me. The grasp is secure for eternity. I looked this up in another version of the Bible called the voice, which is a translation, not a paraphrase. We have these amazing words, quoting, my father has given the flock to me. He is superior to all beings and things. No one is powerful enough to snatch the flock from my father's hand. No one is powerful enough to take them away from the father's hand. Another place I found Quoting, no one is able to steal the redeemed from the Father's hand. Unquote. I think these verses apply to our friend from North Korea. Let's go next to Revelation 1.17. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. He laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And the keys of hell, I have the keys of hell and of death. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. 
here we have these amazing words that John in vision was falling down because of the glory that he was looking at. And Jesus came in his vision and laid his right hand, touching the prophet John, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last. Again, we have these familiar words that we hear in the New Testament over and over from Jesus was meeting people that were afraid and he would say these words, Fear not, my friend, fear not. We come to 1 Peter 4, 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial that which is about to try you, as though some strange thing has happened to you, but rejoice inasmuch as you're partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, we may be glad also with exceeding joy. I would suppose that the little lady from North Korea had read those words. I'm quite certain, in fact, that she had read those words. Before she started out for South Korea, I'm quite certain she had also read Hebrews 11.10, speaking of Abraham. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. 2 Timothy 1.12, For I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Come to 1 Peter 1, 4, to an inheritance incorruptible, and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. So who is this Jesus we've been talking about? Just who is he? Hundreds of years ago in the 1700s, a Christian wrote these words about Jesus. Very profound words. The man's maker was made a man. Ponder these words now. The man's maker was made man, that the Lord of the stars might nurse at his mother's breast, that the bread of life might be hungry, that the fountain of life might thirst, that the light of life might sleep, that the way might be tired from the journey, that the truth might be accused by a false witness, that the teacher be beaten with whips, that the vine may be crowned with thorns, that the foundation be hung on a tree, that strength might be made weak, that he who heals might be wounded, that life might die. When Paul understood the theme of these words, he would write, For me to live is Christ. In him we live and move and have our being. God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of Jesus Christ. For I am determined to know nothing among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. The words we have just read make me think of the words of that beautiful song written a number of years ago. Here are those words. I dreamed I went to that city called glory, so bright and so fair. When I entered the gate, I cried, holy. The angels all met me there. They showed me from mansion to mansion, and oh, the sights I saw. But I said, I want to see Jesus, the one who died for me. Then I bowed on my knees and cried, holy, holy, holy. I thought when I entered that city, my friends knew me well. They showed me all through heaven. The scenes are too numerous to tell. They showed me Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Mark, and Luke, and Timothy. But I said, I want to give praise to the one who died for me. I thought when I saw my Savior, oh, the glory to God. I just fell right down before him, singing praise to the name of the Lord. I bowed down and worshiped Jehovah, my friend of Calvary. I wanted to give praise to my Jesus for saving a sinner like me. Then I bowed on my knees and cried, Holy, holy, holy. From Revelation 22, we're closing now. We have these words that every Christian should take very seriously. For the great controversy is real and soars all around us. Revelation 22, 11 onward. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still.
And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man and woman according as their work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they might have right to the tree of life, and may enter through the gates into the city of God. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and the morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come. Whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even come, Lord Jesus. I turn next to the chapter, one of my favorite chapters in all of Scripture, Revelation 19, the chapter on the marriage supper of the Lamb. We'll start with verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife, the redeemed of all the ages, hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints, which is actually the righteousness of Jesus, as we know. He saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called into the marriage supper of the Lamb. He saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. What a day that will be when Jesus calls us to the marriage supper of the Lamb. We need a closing song this morning. Why don't we just pick He Touched Me. Shackled by a heavy burden, neath a load of guilt and shame, then the hand of Jesus touched me, and I am no longer the same. He touched me, oh, he touched me, and oh, the joy that floods my soul. Something happened, and now I know he touched me and made me whole. Since I met this blessed Savior, since he cleansed and made me whole, I will never cease to praise him. I'll shout it, shout it as eternity rolls. He touched me, oh, he touched me. And oh, the joy that floods my soul. Something happened and now I know. He touched me and made me whole. Our loving Father and Savior of us all, we've been reminded today that when you were on earth, you touched people often. And you allowed people to, people to touch you, even the hem of your garment. And they were all made whole, whoever would do this. We realize today that we cannot personally touch you, but far more important is the fact that we can allow you to touch our minds and our hearts as we study the Holy Scriptures that you've left us. Each one of us open the Holy Book each day as we walk on our pathway to the kingdom. And when you come in the clouds of heaven, we pray that each one of us may be able to look up and say, Lo, this is... My God, I have waited for him, and he will save me. In the name of our precious Savior, amen.